What's good, America? It's your man, Reggie Prima, a.k.a. Big Flow. Today, I am the one and only part of the Big Flow and O Show, except for I've got a very special guest for you. i uh, been going along with my theme with college athletics. This next guest that we have uh, is a five-year head coach with a 52-9 and nine record, three-time CCIW champion, and 2019 Division III National Championship, the pride of Wheaton and now the pride of Naperville, a round of applause for Jeff Thorne. Morning, Reg. All right, my applause button didn't work well, but everyone was clapping. The whole studio was going crazy. You just couldn't hear it today. So how's it going, man? Going great. How about you? Pretty good, man. Just itching, to, itching, itching for progress. Itching for progress in many ways. Looking for yeah. this COVID stuff. Uh, looking for social, social progress. Looking for... The weather to stay nice, just progress in general. That's that's my theme for the for the rest of this week is is progress. So I'm with you. So anyway, Jeff Thorne, guys, I've had the pleasure of knowing you now for a couple of years. Uh, I've known of you for a little bit longer. Um, see what great things you've done and what pride you brought to Naperville with uh, some some local kids and some some not so local kids. But um, let's let's get started. I want to hear these people know kind of your story. So. Let's start with your playing days. Talk to me about the Jeff Thorne, the football player. Well, I was, I was fortunate to play for my dad in high school, um, which which was an incredible experience. Um, best coach I ever played for, uh, best coach I've ever coached with. Uh, just uh, an amazing opportunity. So I got to play quarterback, started for three years in, in high school at Wheaton Central High School, which is now known as Wheaton Marvel South. Now, now it's known as, as Mariano's, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Grocery store yeah, Mariano's, exactly. <laughs> so a couple of years ago, when Eastern Illinois was there, was talk of Eastern Illinois closing. I was I was staring at potentially not having any alma maters. Oh my lord! Uh, so fortunately, uh, Eastern Illinois is is still alive and kicking. And you don't want and, that to uh, be your reputation, Jeff Thorne, the man who shuts schools down. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I'm like carry my sickle around yeah, the Grim right? Reaper. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I got to play for my dad. Had a, just an, an awesome experience in high school. Um, and then had the opportunity to move on and play for Bob Spoo at Eastern Illinois uh, from 1990 to 1993. So just was really blessed from a football standpoint to get those opportunities. Met my wife at Eastern Illinois. That's and, always great. To uh, have any college yeah, career. yeah. So my playing days were great. I, I was fortunate to walk into a situation at Eastern Illinois where I got to compete immediately for the starting job as a true freshman. Mm -hmm. um, but again, fortunate to win that job, and, and season was shortened with an injury and continued on for, uh, you know, my last three years as the starter and you know, really thought I'd get into coaching right away, but my path was a little bit different and, and, you know, maybe we'll get into that, but that's kind of give you a, give you a little background on my, my how was Eastern there. back in the day. I mean, Eastern is one of those schools that like, uh, you know, a lot of people probably don't know about them. They don't think about them, you know, directional schools in each state. And then you start talking about yeah. the notable alumni and be like, Oh my gosh, you know, this school has really yeah, brought yeah. out some people, uh, Sean Payton, uh, Garoppolo, um, yeah, you know, you name it. There's just a lot of people that came out of it. What, what do you think that is with Eastern? They just get some special. You know, guys. I don't know. I I really don't know. But I, there was a point in time, you know, maybe five or six years ago, where there were more NFL head coaches from Eastern Illinois than any other university. You had Brad Childress with the Vikings. You had Mike Shanahan, and then obviously had Sean Payton. Um, and certainly with the success they've had at quarterback with Sean Payton, and then Jimmy Garoppolo and and Tony Romo in between there, uh, really. It's unique, you know, and, and right now, really excited about the, rec the direction that they're headed. They've, they hired Adam Cushing from uh, Northwestern, longtime offensive line coach there. He's the head coach there. I've had uh, several conversations with him and, and just really excited about what he's doing uh, in Charleston as well and trying to revive that program. Well, do, do you think that going to Eastern had anything to do with, with you becoming a coach or, or, or how do you think you became a coach? Obviously, your dad being one that's going to influence there. But yeah. How'd you get into it? Yeah. No, I, I don't think it, it, that I, I had it in my mind. That's what I do. It's what I wanted to do. Even when I was in high school, my path got diverted. Uh, I went into the financial services industry for a period of 13 years, seven of which I was I was coaching with my father at North Central at that time. Mm -hmm. Um but once I really started coaching with him on a more regular basis and calling an offense, uh, I knew immediately that's, you know, that's my passion. It had always been my passion. When the time was right, I was able to transition to full-time coach in 2009. And, you know, it's the best decision I've ever made. Wow. Yeah, that, that is interesting to, to, to be doing the, 
the dual purpose there, you know, I did a little youth coaching, so I wouldn't compare the same mm-hmm. thing. But it's definitely, when you switch the hats from the corporate world or the financial world to, uh, over here to coaching. So, so you've been a head coach now for five years? Right. Yep. So five years, you've amassed an amazing record, 52 and nine. Right. So, um, you know, I don't know kind of what goes into that, but, you know, right now, uh, I think what a lot of people want to focus on, what I want to focus on is, is this past season, a magical season. I'm going to mm-hmm. pull up the stats from look at. So you guys, you guys won every game except one. Mm-hmm. And you, and you pretty much wipe the table. You start off 43 to 13, 46 to 13, 77 to nothing. Then you get your first bump of the road and you, and, and you hit Wheaton College, the local school. I know this one kind of probably yeah. stung a little bit, seeing that's your hometown oh, yeah. college or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. What happened in that game? What did you learn from that game? And how did it help you think through the rest of the season? That's, that's a huge rivalry game. Um, so every year, and it really every year, it, it plays a role in de- deciding who the conference champion is. Obviously, last year, you know, we go in and win the national championship, but we didn't even win our conference. It uh, gives you an idea how strong our conference is. But uh, Wheaton College is a, is a tremendous program, and, and it's been a battle every year since I've been at North Central when we play them. I think what we took away from that game is, is you know, the Navy, we, we've worked with the Navy SEALs a few times now, and uh, they talk about giving 100% 100% of the time rather than the idea of 110%. You hear that a lot. Yeah. But 100%, 100% of the time. Mm-hmm. It's one of the few times in my college coaching career that, we've watched the, the previous games film together as a team rather than offense and defense. We watched it as a team because I just really, I didn't want to say much. I, I didn't want to be hooting and hollering and, and, you know, making guys feel like they're this big. I, I wanted them to watch the film and understand we have a standard to, to play up to and self-diagnose the issues. And, and it just, it was really easy to ask them, was that your best? That's really the only question that, that I had to ask mo- most of the, of the guys who, who maybe didn't play as hard as they, they could. Uh, we made mistakes as coaches. Um, anytime you lose a game, there's, there's things as coaches you could do better. And we, we found some things that we could adjust and made th- those adjustments. Uh, so I really credit our, our coordinators and our assistant coaches for, for making some adjustments, making some changes. But more than anything else, our players watch the film and they realize, you know what, that wasn't our best effort. And we can control that. And from that point forward, we had a sense of desperation. You know, you know in D3, if you don't win your conference, you're at the, at the mercy of the selection committee um, on playoff selection day. And we were the last team to get in. So that sense of desperation that we had from week four on, I think it really served us well in the playoffs because we've been doing it all year long. Break that down real quick. So how does the D3 playoff system work? Um, I know, obviously, the D1, you know, it's a popularity contest for, uh, for for the top four. I'm not too sure about FCS and how that works out with the playoffs, but how does the D3 work? You, you mentioned that it's kind of a selection committee. How many guys get in and kind of talk us through yeah. a little bit? Well, how much time do we have, Reg? Do we have a few hours? Because that, that's what it will take to really describe <laughs> well, it. Well, it is a no, Friday. I've got, got cocktails, you know, around my yeah. shoulder. So. Yeah, no, it's it's there's there's a certain number of – um, automatic bids. So if you win your conference, you're automatically in. Okay. Uh, and how many conferences there are so there many, for D3? Yeah, I believe there's 27 conferences okay. now. So then there's five at-large bids. Okay. And the way they look at those at-large bids, they rank teams regionally. And the, the criteria they're looking at are certainly head-to-head, your winning percentage, and then your strength of schedule. And that's where things get really kind of cloudy at the division three level. There's so many teams that play football, you know, there's 240 teams that play football at our level. So you can imagine the, the range of competitiveness. Um, So one team schedule that shows a really strong strength of schedule may not necessarily, in fact, most likely isn't as strong of a schedule as somebody who plays in an elite conference and has, you know, we have 10 teams in our league. So our, by the very nature of strength of schedule, ours is always going to be right around 500. Mm -hmm. Um, The Ohio Athletic Conference where Mount Union plays has the same issue. So it's it's difficult. If you don't win your conference, it's a challenge to get in. And and fortunately, we've been in the playoffs for enough years where I think that helps a little bit. Um, Yeah, I mean, we we were on pins and needles until that day. Uh, I had received a text message uh, sitting in church that morning that we were in from the committee chair who, who I've known for a, for a long time. And 
go back to that sense of desperation that we had. I didn't tell our players and I didn't tell our coaches because I wanted them going to the meeting with that same sense of desperation. And then on top of that, we were the last uh, at-large team that was announced. So there's five bids. They had announced four. So our guys were, I mean, they were a mess. And so now when they announced the, the bracket and our, you know, they saw North Central, they were pretty excited to say the least. So if I'm, if I'm hearing you correctly, the, 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 the moral of this is go to church. You go to church and good things come to you. So you hit church on Sunday, you get on your knees and you pray to God. During the selection position, uh, committee decision-making time, you have a better chance to get the, the quote. So There you go. That's good. You well, go. I mean, I, I still think that, you know, when I'm looking at the rest of your, your scores here, so, you you know, you're mad 35-14. The next week, Augustana, I'm not sure what kind of a rivalry there. 42-14, looks like they fought for a while. Then 62-3, to 49-6, 87-7. You know, I would kick, I could imagine eighty. Oh, sorry, eighty-two to seven. I could imagine that's Elmhurst College. One of my best friends growing up went to Elmhurst College, so I need to write okay. this one down to to give him a hard time <laughs> about that one. Yeah, eighty-two to seven. You're so mad if you're one of the guys that didn't score a touchdown, right? I mean, you're like <laughs> you could coach, man. I couldn't get a, I couldn't get a couple carries. I couldn't get it. This one, yeah. did you do like the pop Warner? Like you let the lineman run at the end, or you try to keep it a little? No, classy? no. Keep it no. classy. Keep it we, classy. We had our we had our backups in for for you know, the entire second half there. That's good. But Everybody we, else eating popcorn. Then you go 69-14, yeah. 59-32. And I just read these off because, I mean, these scores are amazing. You know, and I had followed you guys um, as far as wins and losses. The scores I really hadn't noticed until I looked them up, and that's just amazing. So you get into the playoffs. Um, you guys are obviously belong there, right, with the end result there. Yeah. You start those off 51-15 against Wabash College, but then you come against Mount Union. So I yeah. think probably – it's safe to say Mount Union is probably the most popular D3 program in the country. Most people know about them. I've heard of them. Um, yeah. they're, they're a powerhouse, right? They're doing this every year, correct? Yeah. You know, they, they had been to the semi, no, no less than the semifinals in the D3 playoffs um, all the way back to 1994 every single year until last year. Wow. So, they're, I mean, they're, they're the holy grail of Division Three football and uh, extremely well coached. They're loaded with talent. Um, so, yeah, that was – that was it. That was the one. And, you know, go back to the, the bracket announcement um, right away. I, I had no idea where we were going to be placed. But as soon as I saw the bracket, we opened with Wabash. Uh, they knocked us out of the playoffs in 2011 on a, on a two-point conversion with 50 seconds left. We lose 29-28. Heartbreaker. Yeah. We blew a 28-7 lead in that game. Mm-hmm. Um, then the second round game is Mount Union. Well, in 2013, Mount Union beat us 41-40 to in the semifinals. Uh, we missed five extra points. So there's two, two one-point oh. losses. Our third, our third round game could have been Wesley College, a, a great program out of Delaware. Um, in my third game as head coach in 2015, they beat us 50-49 to 49 on a two-point conversion with seven seconds left. So I'm looking at this thing going, holy cow, this could be the 2019 is- payback tour. And no that's kind of what I sold to our players. Mm-hmm. We got a chance to avenge these one-point losses that uh, – that hurt so bad for all those former players. So it was just a storybook kind of run. And then, and then Whitewaters is on the other side of the bracket. They'd knocked us out of the playoffs twice, um, 2007 and 2010. So again, we just got to play all these teams that, that we, uh, that you guys wanted to make amends for, you know? So this Mount Union game, 59 to 52, I mean, yeah. great game. Uh, you guys, where do you, do you guys play these home and away or you guys play these in neutral sites? No, these are home and away. So we were home to Wabash. We had to go to Mount Union. We came back home for Delaware Valley. Uh, then we were out at Muhlenberg in Pennsylvania. Um, and then the neutral site game is the national championship game down down in Texas so last what, year. What's the, what's the environment like for, for Mount Union? Is there rabid fans? How is that, how is that going for D3 you know, Yeah, typically, yes. Um, but that's, that's Thanksgiving. The second round of the playoffs is Thanksgiving weekend. Mm-hmm. So... And then on top of that, Ohio State and Michigan were playing that same day. Mm-hmm. So the crowd was, was good. It wasn't off the charts. Okay. Um, we traveled really well. I was thrilled with the crowd that, that we brought with us six hours from home. Um, so, yeah, pretty cool atmosphere, to say the least. That's fantastic. So you get down there. You get to the national championship game. You're on TV. Um, everyone's ready to go. And you roll these guys up just just like a like a cigarette, man. So I, I, I <laughs> love how you guys did this. So this this is it's huge for the South. You know, you guys are right down for people who don't know Naperville. You know, this college is right downtown Naperville. It's kind yeah. of you know the heart of the city. 
You know, DuPage right. Valley, we like to think in Illinois is kind of like the hotbed. Obviously, people in the Catholic League are hotbed football, but we think it's the hotbed. We're in the middle of everything. So this is a, just a great win. You know, great thing to see mm-hmm. to, to see us happen and, and come through. But this is kind of the season that almost didn't happen. A few years ago, you had an opportunity to, to, to leave uh, D3 ranks and, and move up, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? I, I did. Um, I did. And, and, you know, the timing just wasn't wasn't right. And mm-hmm. it was a dream come true, dream offer. Um, and, and really felt initially like this is going to be the right thing. And the more we thought about it and, and the more I talked with the administration at North Central and they were they were amazing through the process. Um, you know, my daughters were going to be a sixth grader and a freshman. My son was going to be a junior. And we, you know, my wife and I just decided, you know, I don't think the timing's right to uproot the family. If they were younger, it would, I think I'd have done it for sure. Um, but the other element to it is my mom's had cancer for nine years and uh, they still live in Winfield here locally. Right. And, I, and honestly, the last element to it was my dad's goal when he took the program over in 2002 was to win a national championship. And, and he talked about it. And we're talking about a program that at that time hadn't won a conference championship since 1960. Wow. So that was a huge goal for him. And, and, and quite honestly, Reg, he had done the heavy lifting mm-hmm. for the program, getting it to where it was when I was fortunate enough to, to take over for him. Uh, so our job is, as coaches was just, hey, we need to finish this. And God willing, and, and uh, thank goodness we got great assistant coaches and players. We were able to get it done last year. I mean, amazing. I know you get some guys. Talk to me about building a, a D3 program. I know you have some challenges, obviously, you know, with recruiting. How is it to build your team? Let's start off with that. How do you get your guys? Well, it's all for us. It's all about our culture. And I know that's uh, I think that's an overused term in coaching right now. But it, it really is truly about our culture. So when we're out recruiting, um, we are recruiting to that culture. Um we want to make sure going in that our players understand what our program's about, faith, family, academics before football, and uh, just developing great men. Our mission is to develop great men, um, guys that will end up being great husbands, great fathers, great employees. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, progress. We need, we need agents of change in our communities, and, and so that's really what our mission is, and winning a national championship is a goal. And fortunately, we were able to do that. But quite frankly, if we never did that and we continue to develop great people, um, I'd be okay and I'd be able to sleep at night. So, you know, just feel really good about the the players that we go about uh, pursuing and making sure they understand what we're about. Yeah, there are uh, differences in how we recruit relative to the D1 level. We don't have athletic scholarships, uh, but we we can offer academic scholarships and, you know, need-based help as well. Uh, but we, we're going to we're going to throw a, a net around the state of Illinois, and we're really going to recruit the Chicago suburbs, particularly the northwest suburbs, really hard. Uh, but we also get down into Florida. We got out get out to Arizona and Colorado, some of those places. This year, we got a kid from um, North Carolina coming as well. Okay, so this year in particular, you know, we were National able to spread that kind of kind of widens yeah. your, your net a little bit. People started looking for yeah, that's it. That's right. So yeah. So so from a timing standpoint. Okay, you know, most college high school players, no offense, but they, they drew it by playing D1 and win national championship D1. And then, you know, yeah. it goes down from there. It's like, all right, national championship D1. All right, let me find a conference championship D1. Let me go yeah. power five. Please give me a scholarship. I don't want to right. pay for school no longer. You know what I mean? So you go back down the line, how that yeah. goes. When do you yeah. come in? Do you, do you look at guys early and kind of track them and think, hey, this guy's tracking for, you know, our level or – do you look for fallbacks? Do you look for the guy that's just a little too short, maybe a little too slow? You know what I mean? How does that work? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, the, the camps that we've had the last several years that we weren't able to have this year, obviously, with, with COVID, uh, have been amazing for us. Last year, we had 1,100 kids come through campus. So now those kids get a chance to see our facilities, uh, work with our coaching staff, because we really we do a lot of the coaching, not because we think we do it better. I know better than that. There's great coaches there, but really the, the reason those higher level coaches are coming is to be able to observe. Mm-hmm. So when we're coaching them, they can just watch, which yeah. is what they want to do. But the benefit to us is these kids are getting to hear from us and get a get, kind of get a sense of what our style is as coaches, which is a really upbeat, fun and positive style. So that's helped a lot. Uh, but to, to get to your point more directly that's where everything starts for us, those mm-hmm. camps, because that's where we're always we're also watching. We've got all the performance times and things that, that we've noticed. So we're 
we're making notes of the kids that we need to stay in contact with. And we re we're kind of aggressive in recruiting. We want to uh, recruit those kids that are right on the fringe. Uh, maybe they have a, D a 1AA offer or FCS offer. Maybe they got D D2 offers. We want to compete for those kids uh, because I think our level of football is really, really high. Mm -hmm. It's Division three, but there's there's so many levels to Division three. And, you know, kids need opportunities. And the education they can get at North Central, downtown Naperville, with all the internship opportunities, things of that nature, I think it's a really compelling uh, argument that we can make. So we've started to drip already on 2021 kids. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had a couple of virtual meetings with recruits, which we haven't done in the past. But given the situation we're in, those are the kind of things that we're having to do differently this year. Uh, but our real recruiting, our hardline recruiting, where we're really going to get out and get in homes and, and have kids come visit, that really won't happen typically until our season is over. And that's that helps because at that point, most kids have an understanding, am I going to get a scholarship or not? And when they, when they know that maybe not, mm -hmm. that's when they really start to look at us a lot more seriously. So, you know, do you find some of these kids come in and, and they're – and it, it, you have to – kind of mentally adjust to the fact that, hey, I'm in a D3 school now and accept it? Or do you think it's kind of like, all right, by the time they're here, they're excited, they're, they're bought in or whatever? Um, I just wonder what that, from a mental standpoint, if, if your dream was to go somewhere else, you know, you get a lot of kids who think I'm better than this. Maybe they find out that they get there that they're not even starting, but, you know, they, they, they have a hard time with the acceptance. Yeah, you know, it doesn't happen that much, believe it or not. Uh, I think most of those kids come to the conclusion when, when, they, when they never got an offer Hey, this is a really good option. And now you, you start to talk about Brock Rudder mm -hmm. and what he was able to do. And kids kids can look at that and say, hey, you know what? If I'm good enough, they'll find me. I mean, fantastic. What a, what a better way to do it. Let's talk about Brock yeah. Rudder's story. Um, yeah. I mean, here's a guy that is with the 49ers now, right? Came from D3. Yeah. There's a bunch of Power 5 uh, quarterbacks uh, getting fitted for suit and ties to go get a job right now. And here's a D3 guy that comes out, broke all the records, and now he's, now he's in an NFL camp. How do you get a guy like that? How does that guy come, come to you? Does he develop late typically? Um, does he usually have a bad experience maybe at a different school and come back to you? How does that happen? Yeah, yeah that, that kind of addresses what you would said before about, about bounce back kind of kids. So we, mm -hmm. get, we get some transfers every year, mm -hmm. uh, Brock being, you know, the most prolific of all that we've had. And, and he was at Indiana State for a year, had a full scholarship, and uh, just didn't have a great experience. So then he transferred to us in the winter term in 2016, so was able to go through spring ball with us. Ironically, that year we traveled to Europe, uh, which we do every three years. We were in Ireland and Scotland. So we got to see Brock's leadership mm -hmm. and just how he fits in with people right away. And it was pretty clear at right away that he was the guy that was going to be leading us for four years. So we were really fortunate to get Brock. Fortunately, we had two of his high school teammates that were already in our program that were having a good experience. So they really helped in that recruitment. Um, but he was an incredibly talented kid to begin with. Um, we, we were just blessed to have the opportunity to coach him. He's an incredible kid, uh, hardworking, loves the game. And, uh, so that development happened, but he had a lot of those natural instincts and abilities when he got to us. Now, I know that when you come down from, uh, uh, I think uh, that's FCS for Indiana State. You come down from FCS, you yeah. go up to D3, you can play right away. Do you ever get guys that like play with you guys, knock it out, and then they go up? And if they do, do they have to sit out, or how does that work? No, we, that really doesn't happen. Um, we had one kid years and years ago, big offensive lineman who came to us from down in southern Illinois, uh, didn't really, didn't play at all as a freshman with us, but, but thought that he, he was that level mm -hmm. and he transferred to Tennessee, uh, didn't play there uh, and then transferred right back to a different division three. That's the only time that's ever happened in our program's history. Okay. You know, typically guys, guys come to us and, uh, hope, hopefully they have a great experience, which, which is the goal. It's what we're trying to do for guys. Mm -hmm. And then they stay with it and, you know, develop into really, really great people and, hopefully great football players, but we want to lead with great people. Yeah. And I look at it the same way. I say, you know, a lot of people are going back and forth and a lot of friends I know and acquaintances, you know, looking at what school their kids go to, you get caught up. And I'm like, listen, there's such a, such a few kids that you're going to know that are going to go pro. Very few. And yeah. again, the Brock Rutters of the world found a way to do it even from, from, from not being in a division one power five. So you can go pro that everywhere you go, find a school, enjoy the school, make lifelong friends. There's great kids at every school. Yeah. There's, there's very successful people that come out of every school. Um, 
there's 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 uh, cute girls at every school. You know, you can find every, <laughs> everything that you're going to find that you need out of yeah. a school. You can do it. Enjoy the football and do what you got to go do. And sometimes don't let your ego get in the way. That's kind of the way the way I've seen it. So that's good. Couldn't agree with you more. I think you know, going someplace where you're wanted, mm -hmm. and then where you know that there will be an opportunity. Uh, because with opportunity, you can people can do whatever they want with that opportunity. But you got to be someplace where that's presented to you. You know, you said that, and I, and I uh, you know, knowing a lot of recruits myself, I, I say that theme a lot. Go, go to a school that wants you, not a school that'll take you. Every school yeah. will take some guys, right? Because they got to mm -hmm. take some guys. But if they want you, it's a much different experience. And you know, having played college football myself, there's a difference yeah. between the guys that were really wanted to come in and take. Now, not to say mm -hmm. the guys that were just taken can't can't be successful. You can uh, you can climb that hill as well. But yeah. if a school really wants you, you know, it's a good fit and it's a great thing. And face it, you know, after you go through there, you know, the, and you get in the real world, people aren't going to be wounding you and swooning you trying to get you to come do things anymore in life. You know, you're out here right. trying to find a way to earn a living. What do you say, like, a big difference is through, like, the life of, like, a D1 guy versus a D3 guy? You know, what kind of time requirements, uh, yeah. pressures, different things like that? Huge difference. Uh, t from a time standpoint, uh, we don't get as many hours with them. Uh, it's truly academics first and – you know, guys come to us and they're going to they're going to get to major in whatever they want to major in and they're going to get to pursue the degree that they truly want. And our practice schedule has no impact on their education. So, you know, guys regularly are late to practice a couple of times a week because their classes run into it. And that, that's typically juniors and seniors, but even so, some freshmen as well. Mm -hmm. And then there's days where we have to make an announcement. Hey, six o'clock classes, you got to go. You know, and they've got to leave at 530 to get to class. So guys miss portions of practice every day of the week at our level mm -hmm. uh, because they're there to get that education and, and make sure that they're fulfilled and getting the degree that they want. So I think there's a little bit of a difference from that standpoint. And certainly, you know, guys are playing because they love to play at our level. You, you know, having played at the highest level, guys got a full scholarship but is not loving it and really maybe doesn't love the game. He thinks about, man, I – I can't give up this scholarship. I got to. I got to finish through. At our level, they play because they love it. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what. From our standpoint as coaches, we understand if we're not making it fun and rewarding for them, we're not going to keep our players. Right. So that's that's continually at the very you know top of our priority list as a coaching staff to say we got to make sure these guys are enjoying and having fun with what we're doing. Uh, one of the things my dad always talked about was making sure the players are laughing on the ramp up to the locker room every day instead of heads down, dreading, you know, the, the conditioning that we just finished. You know, I trying to always unequivocally, D1 does not give a darn if your head yeah. is down or your head is up on the way <laughs> because you're a business. So, you know, it sounds like it's just, you know, a matter of fit, trying to find the right fit for school. And that's the beauty of it. I'm glad yeah. that it, they have the different levels. And it's a beautiful sport. And I think it does so much for so many. Um, and you don't really realize it usually until you're our age and you're looking backwards at what it can do. So that's great. Yeah. Well, how has this COVID been impacted? You mentioned the fact that you guys had to do some virtual tours, virtual meetings. Yeah. Um, you guys don't have spring ball, though, do you? No. To, well, we do. We just can't wear pads. Okay. So this year we lost our spring ball. What typically for us the spring season is a lot of seven-on-seven -seven work, um, a lot of timing work in the passing game on an, from an offensive standpoint. Um you know, from a running game standpoint, there's not a ton you can do, but you can work on your ball handling and, and tracks for the running back mm -hmm. and things of that nature. Defensively, defending the pass is really um, what you spend most of your time doing in, in the spring when you can't wear pads. And you got to be so careful uh, when you're running any kind of seven on seven without, you know, a helmet or any kind of head protection on. Um, but it's also really valuable. There's ways to practice without equipment and, and accomplish a lot of things. So losing that this year of all years with Brock having graduated and, and really trying to identify who's that next guy going to be, mm -hmm. timing wasn't ideal. But but what we have been able to do is spend so much time virtually going through our offense and our defense and, and reteaching and showing film. Uh, so it's just been a different way to go about coaching and teaching for this period of time. Uh, I, I'm dying to get back to my office. Uh, I haven't had, I haven't been able to be in my office for for more than five minutes uh, for three months. But at the same time, I do have a job, so I, I'm not complaining. But yeah. it's nice when when the rains are are taken off and we can get back to work. 
on a, on a regular basis. Now, you and I have had conversations about what, what, what we think the fall is going to look like, and I know things change. Mm-hmm. What do you think the fall is going to look like now? Well, it was encouraging to see yesterday that the NCAA announced the date that Division Three will be able to go back and start practicing, and it's earlier than it's ever been for all schools. Typically, it's tied to when your first game is. And then also yesterday, you saw the July 13th date uh, for Division One schools to be able to get back to work with coaches. So, I mean, the NCAA seems really committed to making sure we can get back and have a football season. There are all sorts of health measures that are in place. So this isn't a willy-nilly kind of thing where we're throwing caution to the wind and getting back to playing football. They've put a lot of thought into how to go about doing this to keep athletes and coaches too and fans and everybody else as safe as humanly possible. So it's going to be a lot different. I mean, for instance, when we every day at North Central, we've already talked, we're going to have to take the temperature of our player every single day. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine how that could impact how much meeting time we have, how much practice time we have, because there's going to be a time allotment to that. Uh, Every week when we go to travel to a game, if it's an away game, well, home game too, we have to take the temperature. There are going to be continual health assessments uh, that will be given to our players to make sure nobody is taking the field uh, that would compromise someone else. And so that's that's really encouraging to me. Well, I've heard, I can, you know, I always heard, I say I heard, and, and uh, my co-host Oliver's not here today, he's like, where'd you hear? And I always say the internet, because I can never remember where it's at. <laughs> but they're saying yeah. that it's less likely an asymptomatic person is contagious now. I don't know if you've heard that. Um, I don't know yeah. how real that is. That being said, if you catch somebody, are you guys going to be doing like COVID testing with people mm-hmm. like this, okay, so yeah. if you test someone and they test positive, do you have to forfeit the game? Uh, do you know that person? Um, yeah. You just treat that person as the one who's sick and everyone else assume that they're not? Is that how it works? Yeah, it, you know, when, we had a meeting Wednesday, uh, our conference coaches and our uh, conference commissioner reviewing all the soup to nuts, all these things. And, and that was one of the things that came up. So if, if you have a player who has a temperature of 102 or higher, they cannot play, and they're immediately sent to be tested. Mm-hmm. If they're negative, they just don't play, and when their fever is gone, they can get back to playing. But if they are positive, there will be a 7- to 10-day self-quarantine for that player, and they will not be able to practice or play at all uh, during that time period. So the, the season's going to look different in so many different ways because you're going to every team is going to have a player here or there that does test positive and is going to have to sit out for a while. Yeah. Um, so you know, having a team with depth, and, and experience, I think, is going to be really important this year more than any other year. So, do you do you what other measures do you do? I mean, you know, first, do you think they'll play with any sort of masks at all? Because I saw like this Under Armour mask came out yesterday. I don't know if it's breathable or not. I couldn't imagine playing with yeah. it, like, but whatever. You think that there's going to be any protective gear like that that will happen? You know, I don't know. I, I've I've seen those same things. That wasn't part of the discussion yesterday, but I also don't know what's happening at the NCAA level. There's there's just been so much uncertainty. That's the one thing I would say has been the hardest thing to, to really deal with because you're trying to you're trying to plan for what you're going to do and you're used to being in a routine and, and we just don't have any idea. Well, we finally know now when, mm-hmm. but even now in Illinois, we're still in phase three. Well, phase four, the vote is, I think, June 26th is the date. We need to see the right numbers. If we don't get to phase four, that's going to create some challenges. Um, but even in phase three, Three, for instance, I, I'm trying to schedule rooms for the season, and I can't schedule them. We're still where you can't have more than 50 people in any dwelling at one time. So everything's kind of put on hold until we know a little bit more. Hopefully, in a couple of weeks, we get good news and we can move forward. Yeah. Are you gonna? Do you think you see yourself doing any rules, like socially rules with these kids, like um, stay away from your girlfriend? You know, stay away. From, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like to minimize it. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, like it's important. It's a, it's a, it's a small window for a football season. Yeah. I mean, have you thought about doing any social rules with kids like that, or? Uh, not. We haven't talked about that yet. Right now, I'm just I'm more concerned with when we're going to be able to be back and really listening to the guidance that North Central College. Uh, we've got an institutional response team who's been working night and day, um, looking at what the governors put out, looking at the different numbers, looking at what the NCAA has put out. I'm going to fall back on their guidance. Yeah. We've got an incredible training staff, one of the best in the Midwest athletic training staff and uh they've been out in front of this thing and and doing everything they can to keep us informed so whatever they tell me to do i'm going to do i trust them Mm -hmm. michigan state's doing some things with their athletes that i think is a good idea they're 
uh, we're taking our son on Sunday to report Monday, they all get tested, but then they have to self quarantine with their small group of people that they live in and around. So the roommate and anybody else that's in their little community, that's who their group is going to be a week later. They have to test again. And if they're still negative, now that group is who he works out with for the next few weeks. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they stay, they're somewhat self quarantined. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's a really good idea. You guys who don't know, his son is Peyton Thorne. He'll be the next starting quarterback for Michigan State. So we got to. Uh, no, no, no. He's got, he's got a lot of work. We to got do that doing. That we got one. confidence in our man, Peyton Thorne, the pride of Naperville. We know that's going to happen. But yeah, because Alabama going back, and I just want to make sure everybody got the yeah. plug for Peyton. I love that kid. Um, <laughs> the Alabama went, they went on a Tuesday, they all tested. And then Wednesday, they, they all hung out together. And then Thursday, they found right. out like five people had COVID. So now it's like, what happens? I guess. You retest, and I don't know. It just that's the part that scares me. Is like, okay, the the reaction you have to know somebody's going to get sick, somebody's going to have to have it, and how do you do it? It's it's encouraging to find out the asymptomatic people may not be very uh, contagious. And I was right. wondering how the hell did they get it in the first place if they never were around somebody who was sick? But I don't know how that goes. Well, well you know, I've, I've I've got a few friends who uh, had no idea they ever had it. And, and they randomly got went to get tested, and, and they found out they were carrying the antibodies. So, there, again, there's just so many things we don't know about this thing. Yeah. Um, and I think as time goes by and, and different tests are created and more antibody tests are done, um, I think we'll be in a, a better situation. But right now, there's just so much uncertainty. It's hard to tell anybody where we're going to be in a week, let alone two months. Yeah. Well, all we can do is hope and pray that that works. What does next season look like? Let's say we have a season. What does it look like for you guys? You're going to repeat national championships, repeat conference championships, beating everybody 72 to six again. <laughs> the goal is to, is to go and and the goal is to win the conference and have a chance to to defend the national championship. Obviously, we've got 17 starters back, so we have one of those really experienced teams. What we have to do is we got to find. You know, who's that guy going to be that's pulling the trigger? And, and if we can get a guy coached up and he plays at a high level, um, I think we've got a really good chance to have another great season. We're excited about it. I can tell you that. I'm, 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 like you said, hoping and praying that everything works out, that we're able to get back and be safe and, and play football. Okay. Before I let you go, if there's a kid out there, he's about to be a senior, he really wants to play for North Central, get a chance to win a championship, what's his best way of getting his information to you so he can evaluate it? You know, just go on our website. There's a there's a flyer that he can fill out, just a recruiting flyer uh, questionnaire. He can get that submitted. Our, our recruiting coordinator then will get him into our database, and we'll reach back out to him and just kind of start that process of communicating. Um, tell him about our place and what we're about, and, and he can learn more about North Central the College itself and academically what is available to him. So that's the best way. Just reach out to us and start the dialogue. Well, that sounds great, Coach. Hey, thank you so much for coming on our show. It's been great, very informative. Uh, good luck to you this season. Let's hope that COVID doesn't take that from us. All right. Thanks, Big Reg. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate the opportunity. All right. Take care, my friend. You too. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching the show. Um, if you like the show, please share it on your Facebook page. Hit like, subscribe, or whatever the heck that button is. Uh, and we're out till next time. Thank you. Come, but let you know where I'm coming from, yeah. No, baby, what you